There's a lot of talk at the minute about how F1 is boring because it's one man winning all the time and one team winning all the time. Sort of the same deal as to how it was five or six years ago. Only the names have changed, really. There's also mutterings about how that same team that is winning today could potentially win every race of this season. 22 races or however many it's supposed to be after the cancellation of the San Marino Grand Prix earlier this year. I know that's not what it was actually called, but I'm old. And it seems to be an odd thing to happen, winning every race. It's never happened before, but on a handful of occasions back in the 1950s and 60s, back when only a certain amount of races counted for the championship, two drivers managed to take 100% of the available points. Alberto Ascari in 1952, where the best four of the eight counted, and Jim Clark in 1963 and 1965, when it was the best six results that counted. In 1963, Clark was so dominant that one of his seven wins was one of the scores not counted towards that overall tally. 54 points of a possible 54 in both of those seasons, 63 and 65 that is, while Ascari took 36 of a possible 36, and had two wins not counted. When you're talking about the greatest drivers of all time, you know, all-round drivers, I mean, Clark and Ascari, they've got to be up there before you even begin to think of Schumacher, Hamilton, Senna, and so on. But, Clark and Ascari didn't win every race. Ascari retired from the 1952 Indy 500 and was the only European driver to take part when the 500 was a round of the F1 World Championship, and Clark had an 8th place, 2nd place, and 3rd place in 1963 and ended the 1965 season with a 10th and 2 retirements, as well as missing Monaco to do the 1965 Indy 500, which he won. In 1988, however, a car so dominant and driven by two of the most successful Formula 1 drivers ever would go pretty close, if not for a bit of a moment at the Italian Grand Prix. That car was the McLaren MP44, McLaren's big bold move for the 1988 season, given that it was the last year of turbocharged engines, and a lot of the other teams, if not almost all the other teams, had migrated over to 3.5 litre naturally aspirated engines that would be mandatory for 1989. Honda was also on board, having been persuaded over from supplying Williams and was regarded as being the strongest engine of the time. So Honda and McLaren were together, and while Gordon Murray is the person slapped with all the praise for this wonderful car, it was actually designed by an American. An American called Steve Nichols. Well, I mean, there is a bit of a hoo-ha about all of that because of a couple of things. Number one is that there's disputes over whether the car was a continuation of the 1987 MP43 or that Nichols took the Murray-designed Brabham BT55 and worked that to be the MP44 instead. Now, Joe Ramirez is one of those who says that the car is Nichols' design, while Murray says, The thing about Steve Nichols being chief designer is the biggest load of rubbish you've ever heard. The MP44 was not designed by Steve Nichols, I can promise you that. At the risk of sounding like Mr. Clarkson, let's not dwell on ripped off and get on with things. One of the key features of the car was that the driver was sitting super low, much like they do today. 1988 was one of the first years where the FIA said the driver had to be reclined in the car. Prost, being so short, I think he's only, what, 5'2", 5'3", was able to sit close to how he used to with no issue and be within the rules, and preferred to be more upright, while Senna loved being reclined. Honda had also worked on getting the most fuel efficiency out of the engine due to rules regarding fuel flow and maximum fuel allowed on board, as refueling was banned in this era. So yeah, even in the balls-to-the-wall all-out 1980s, they were saving fuel. Even with this effectively detuned engine, the car would have had somewhere between 650 and 700 horsepower at 12,500 RPM. The Judd in the Williams only had about 600 or so. So needless to say, this thing was quite overpowered. So much so that at Imola, both the McLarens were the only cars to go sub 1 minute 30 around this 3 mile track. They did times in the 27s. No other car broke the 90 second barrier. Other cars would or could be quicker in a straight line, but because the MP44 had superior grip and traction compared to everybody else, it was like they were racing in a different league. During the race, the next fastest car in terms of the fastest lap of the race was one and a half seconds slower than the McLarens. Reliability was also extremely good. In fact, it was too good, especially for this era. The MP44 had reliability on par with today's cars, with the only mechanical retirements being at the Italian Grand Prix, which is the focus of today's episode, and the British Grand Prix, where Prost retired with handling problems and an engine misfire that caused him to be lapped by Senna. 
Senna's only retirement of the season prior to the Italian Grand Prix came as the result of overdriving when he didn't need to at Monaco and had a well, an embarrassing retirement from an easy victory. With the exception of Brazil where Senna was disqualified, Monaco where Senna retired and Silverstone where Prost withdrew, up until the Italian Grand Prix of 1988, McLaren had scored 8-1-2s. Eight one twos in eleven races. That's what happens when you have an OP car with two great drivers in it. Although it has to be said, qualifying at Monza was not quite the formality as it had been at other races. The gap between the slower of the two McLarens to the third place car was just three tenths of a second. That third place car being Gerhard Berger's Ferrari, which was running a V6 turbo just like McLaren, but unlike McLaren, had been struggling with fuel consumption. Alboreto had run out of fuel at Silverstone with three laps left. Berger on the final lap. John Barnard had suggested tweaking the engine to run with less RPM and changing some of the mapping to overcome this, but for qualifying at Monza they could turn the thing right up, and the same went for Hockenheim where the Ferraris were fastest in the speed traps. Honda had built their engine specifically for the 88 regulations. Ferrari was just running the 87 engine but turned down. Barnard's suggestions had fallen on deaf ears at Maranello. Now Barnard was already disliked because he worked out of an office in England, not in Italy, and had banned wine from any lunches and dinners at testing and race weekends. It wasn't until the German Grand Prix that his ideas were actioned. It has to be said though that at Silverstone, Ferrari had dented the pole position monopoly of the MP44 with Berger starting on pole for that race, and had clocked a 204 mile an hour speed trap score, I guess if you can call it that, at Hockenheim. But when the race got underway, it looked like business as usual, although Prost did get the better of Senna away from the line. But an engine misfire like the one he'd had at Silverstone crept in upon leaving the first chicane, and Senna retook the lead, with Berger keeping the alien McLaren honest. Prost had maxed out his turbo to keep up, but that probably made things worse. Berger then started to drop off a bit as he realised his Italian Grand Prix might end up like his British one. 30 laps in, Prost, with his knackered engine, managed to close to within 2 seconds of Senna, but five laps later the Ferraris had both overtaken him and there was no point in continuing. The misfire had got worse and that was him done. Alboreto was also having issues with his gearbox, so backed off to let the oil cool down because the car had slipped out of fourth gear and then went after Berger. In the final few laps the Ferraris had caught up to Senna. Some think he was taking it easy to the lead just nursing the car home, others think he'd used too much fuel and was having to back off to ensure the win. Either way, it was all for nothing because Senna had come up to lap traffic. The car in question was a Williams. A Williams that should have been occupied by Nigel Mansell, but he was not racing due to having the chicken box. Nigel Mansell and some weird injury. Name a better combination. Martin Brundle had stepped into that car for the Belgian Grand Prix and was supposed to be there for this one, but his team boss in the World Sports Car Championship, Tom Walkinshaw, had said no. Instead, the car was given to Jean-Louis Schlesser, the nephew of Joe Schlesser who was killed at the 1968 French Grand Prix. On top of this, and somewhat ironically, Schlesser was one of Brundle's rivals in the WSC. Heading into the first of the two chicanes that opened the lap, as was, it's a different chicane then to how it is now, Schlesser locked one of his wheels and went deep into the first of the left-handers. Senna sees the gap and goes inside, but from watching the footage I think Senna was anticipating Schlesser to cut the right-hander and rejoin behind. As such, Senna cuts across the front of Schlesser's Williams and the contact breaks Senna's right rear suspension, with the McLaren spinning around and stopping on the exit kerb of that first part of the chicanes. You'd think Senna would be absolutely raging over this, but no. He simply said, He locked a brake and I thought he had run really wide, well off line. Then as I came inside him, he came back onto a tight line and we collided. It was a big disappointment, but what is done is done. Schlesser would later go to McLaren and apologise, and it was all settled with a handshake. Schlesser never raced in Formula 1 again, but I don't think the two are connected. Berger and Alboreto went through first and second, and looped round again to start the final lap. After that final lap, the monopoly was broken. Someone other than the McLaren had won a race that year. It was also quite fitting, as if there was some divine intervention or stuff like that. On the 14th of August in 1988, Enzo Ferrari had died at the age of 90. Enzo had actually died prior to the Belgian Grand Prix, so for the two Ferraris to come across 1-2 at the first Italian Grand Prix after the death of the Ferrari founder, like I said, it was like fate had intervened. The Tifosi could not have cared less about Senna being at the side of the road out of the race. They probably sent case after case after case of wine to Schlesser's house. 
But after the race, it looked like Berger could have been disqualified. Following the Grand Prix, as you've seen probably hundreds of times on TV, the cars have to go through legality checks and it appeared that the tank in the Ferrari was bigger than it should have been. The limit was 150 litres, but when they filled Berger's tank to the top, it filled up at 151.5 litres of fuel. They filled it up again, and again, and again. Three occasions they found it to be over the legal limit in terms of capacity. On the fourth attempt, they found the tank to be 149.5 litres. Third place Eddie Cheever in the Arrows had the same problem. His came out 149.5 litres too after multiple attempts. So, I don't know how this all works. I mean, surely if it's, if it's over, it's over, right? I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not saying that it was rigged in favour of Ferrari and they went, yeah, it's all good, you can win after Ferrari died and all that stuff. I'm just thinking, if it's over, it's over, but I'm not an engineer. Answers on a postcard, please. Since both McLarens no scored, it was as you were at the top of the standings. Senna on 75, Prost on 72. Berger was third on 37, with Alboreto on 22 points. And Prost would then win three of the final four races of the season and end the season with 105 points to Senna's 94, which on any normal day would have made him world champion. But because in these days the best 11 races counted to the overall score, Senna took the championship instead. 90 to 87. Strange rule, I know, but it was brought in when teams and drivers would skip races to do others, so... I mean, I don't know. I've, I've already done a video on this kind of thing. I'll leave a link in the description, but I'm sure there will be the Prost v Senna fan war in the comments over who deserved it and who didn't. So that then begs the question, could something similar happen this year, or could Red Bull go one better? But anyway, the story of how lap traffic got in the way of perfection if you've learned something new here today, then like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more stuff like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the support. And if you want to help out on a more personal level, there's a link to Patreon down in the description, along with links to everything else like Discord, socials, and an F1 store affiliate link if you want to buy F1 merch and give me a kickback in the process. Or the super thanks if you just want to leave me some beer money. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.